speaker is Johannes Borgard, and he'll talk about one-way quantum repeater with minimal resources. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for a great conference and the program committee for allowing me to give this talk. Uh, and um, yeah, as the title is, uh, one-way quantum repeater with minimal resources. So we're going to talk about quantum communication. So I'll start off by just motivating that a bit. Um, so why do we care about quantum communication? With all these opportunities, these promises of quantum communication, of course, there's a lot of things in quantum key distribution, uh, more general quantum cryptology. Um, people also think about we can actually, if we can send qubits, we can have enhanced metrology. There are networks of clocks or telescopes. Uh, there's distributed quantum computation. Um, and in some cases, you can have some reduced complexity com uh, communication complexity for various problems that you want to solve, like leader election. Um, and all of these things are, of course, very exciting. Um, for this thing, I think one should think of QKD. This is kind of the main application of what I'm going to talk about. Um, because the, the main challenge of these quantum communication, at least for long distances, that's basically that uh, there are transmission losses. Um, so we need to transmit a qubit over a long distance. We need high key rates. Um, but just sending it through a fiber won't work. There's some intuition length. At best, a telecom, maybe 22 kilometers, which means that if you're sending it over 1,000 kilometers, it's just going to be very unlikely that the photon will actually make it. So even though we have a fast uh, emission rate, we're still not really going to get the photon within a reasonable time frame. Um, so how to deal with that? People have suggested to use quantum repeaters. And I'm going to try to divide it into two groups, two-way repeaters and one-way repeaters. Uh, and I've tried also to put a little bit how I view the differences between the two, though I should say that uh, probably some of these things can be debated depending on what kind of community you come from. But the way I view it, two-way repeaters is where you take the total distance, you divide it into segments, uh, and these segments are small enough such that you can generate entanglement by just having uh, direct transmission of a quantum signal, that being a photon. Um, once you have entanglement, you can then do a Bell measurement to swap the entanglement to longer distances. Um, so here you re we require quantum memories because you need to wait for one segment. Well, once that has succeeded, you need to wait for the neighboring segment in order to swap it. So you need quantum memories. You need entanglement purification to deal with operational errors. And the repetition rate of these repeaters are to first order set by the two-way signaling between these repeater stations. So that's around kilohertz. Um, I should mention that, in principle, if you have enough memory, you can go all the way down to like local repetition rate if you have sufficient memory. But again, this requires that you have a lot of memory. Um, repeater spacings usually, when people look at this, are around 30 to 50 kilometers. I mean, some cases a bit more, some cases a bit less. Uh, then there's another type of repeaters, one-way repeaters. Uh, the reason why it's called one-way is that here you're just transmitting a signal in one direction. So instead of having you know, a signal sent to some heralding station and a uh, success signal sent back, here you just send uh, a quantum signal. You use an error correcting code to deal with transmission loss and operational errors. So you just send it from one repeater station to the next. And then in the next repeater station, you correct these errors, and then you send it off. Um, so here, the requirement for quantum memories is not that strict, basically, because you just need memory enough to do your local error correction. So um, that's the one difference with these, these two. Um, and naturally, then, the repetition rate is set by a local processing rate of this repeater, because you don't need to wait for a heralding signal to come back, uh, at least for these kind of key uh, generation schemes. For these things, when people look at them, repeater spacings are around one to three kilometers, so more closely spaced than before. And that has to do because we have a, an error correcting code. We can only correct a certain amount of, of uh, errors, basically. And I'm going to focus on these here. The reason why I'm going to focus on that is that there's some hardware being developed uh, based on solid state systems. It could be like um, diamond defects and quantum dots. And they have usually quite excellent photon emission properties, but not that long memory. Um, and that's basically what we want for these kind of one-way repeaters. And people have, of course, looked at one repeaters before. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, but here are like two codes that people have, a lot of people have focused on. The other people have looked at other codes and QDIT systems and so on. But um, at least kind of historically, the parity code has played a large role. And this is what you see here, where you encode in some concatenated GSC states. 
Um, and people have looked at that with uh, like matter-based uh, implementation, so where you have in quantum emitters and spin systems through repeater stations. And for such a code, uh, estimates is that you have you need around you know, 200 matter qubits per repeater station to get this going. Um, and then for error correction, you also need to do on the same order of spin photon gates uh, to correct these things. Um, then people have looked at like all optical repeaters. And for that, they looked at these tree cluster encoding uh, originally proposed for, for quantum optical quantum communication. Um, and they can correct very efficiently for loss. Uh, so in these all optical, they look at basically you use um, linear optics to do Bell measurements to um, connect these photons. And when people do estimates, you need more than a million phot single photon sources per repeater station. And you need to keep around 1,000 photonic qubits to generate those per node. Um, and if it's linear optics, you need like kilometer long delay lines to get this working, a lot of people. Um, or, and if you, people also look at the parity code with, with uh, linear optics, but then of course you also need a lot of linear optics bell measurements uh, to do this. Um, so the motivation for this work is could one maybe if we, we we're gonna focus on matter-based, but we're gonna, we wanna decrease the number of matter-based qubits that we need per station because having 200 per station and doing all these gates ferry correction seems a bit uh, much. So um, we've tried to, to minimize that. And we're going to focus not on the parity code, but actually this tree cluster encoding. So as you say, for the linear optics, what they do there is they use this tree encoding basically to simulate a quantum memory, because photons, uh, well, they want to make a quantum memory with photons. So they use these tree clusters to encode a qubit in it, and then that corrects the logical qubit. And in some proposals, this photonic memory is kept at the repeater stations. Uh, and some signal photons are sent to generate entanglement. In other proposals, this memory is also sent together with the signal photons. But in all cases, it's basically like a two-way repeater So for these things. So you still send a signal, and then you need a routing signal to come back that you actually got the photon. And we want to look at a truly like one-way repeater where we send these tree clusters from one repeater station to the next, and we don't need any routing signal. So that's kind of the next thing. How do we propose to do this? So this is the repeater. A very a uh, crude sketch of it. Um, these blue things are just the repeater uh, stations, and these yellow tree-like things are encoded states that we send between them. Um, so let's look into it. So at the first station, we're going to encode a qubit. You can do it in very different ways, but think of the dots as photons, and the other, this, this with a little arrow, that's a spin. So we imagine that we have like uh, what I would call the root qubit of the tree as a spin, and the rest are uh, photons, and I call like a root qubit, and then first branch of the, the green ones, second branch of the blue ones, and so on. Um, imagine that we have some qubit that we want to send, so we want to encode it in our tree, and we do that basically by doing a bell measurement between these two. Could be another spin qubit that we do it with. So now we've encoded it, then we're going to transmit it down the line. We need to correct for errors, for transmission loss. So here comes an uh, encoded uh, tree. And we lost some qubits, these green, uh, sorry, these uh, gray ones that are not there anymore. And now we want to re-encode it into a fresh tree and then send it off to the next repeater station. And what you need to do that is basically just to do a bell measurement between one of the first of the qubits that survived and the root qubit of the new tree. So that's a two qubit measurement. And then you need to do single qubit measurements of the rest uh, in either the C or the X basis. And unfortunately, we need a little bit of feed forward here because depending on whether the first qubit, first double qubit is there or not, the measurement basis order changes. So if it's not there, you need the next branch to be measured in the X basis, and the, then the next one in the C, and so on. If it's there, it's reversed. But that's kind of the only uh, feedback you need. All right, so that's how you encode it. And then you send it all the way down to the end station. Let's say we want to do uh, QKD. Then we just need to measure in some basis that we choose. That you do by basically measuring the first one of the first of the qubits in that basis, and then measure out the rest qubit of the qubits of the tree in the C and X basis, basically. You should say if there's any other surviving first of the qubits, you need to measure them out in the C basis. Disconnect them, basically. So in that way, you can, you can get your information out. All right, and just to give a little more, I mean, just look at an example here. Um, when I find a tree, I'm going to say the branching vector. So this is a 2, 2 tree. It branches in 2 and then in 2 again. Um, and you can see I've tried to write the cat's uh, representation of this tree in a color coding. 
uh, when you encode, you do a bell measurement um, between some qubit that you want to encode. Here, the orange dot, the spin, and that brings you to this state here. So this qubit that I encoded, I imagine that it was in some superposition alpha 0 plus beta 1. Uh, so now I've encoded it in the tree. If I lose something, so here I imagine that I lost these two photons uh, to the very end here. You can see that if I measure the final um, blue photon that is left on this one branch, I can still retrieve the information that I encoded here. I should say this 2 2 tree is not fault tolerant. This was just for demonstrations. By, it, by, by expanding the tree, you can make it fault tolerant. So this whole business here, it's described uh, in this uh, reference down here, um, where they talk about it as counterfactual error correction, basically. All right. Um, the next thing is, how do we generate these trees? So here, uh, there's been this proposal for a so-called photonic cluster machine gun. Gun. I don't know uh, whether the name is fitting or not, but it's quite fun. Um, the idea is basically if you have some quantum emitter consisting of three states, you have two stable ground states, zero and one, go to qubit in, and then you have some excited state that you can decay and collect the light. Then basically what you do is you start by preparing a superposition of zero and one, then you shine a laser pulse and excite it, and then you just let it decay and collect a photon. Then what you can do is you can do a rotation of these two, so you basically uh, map 0 to 1, 1 to 0. And then you do the same thing again. Excite 1, and then decay. And then you basically create this state. So you have like early and late photon as encoded as 0 and 1. And what you can do, so here on the um, left side, the black dot is the spin in this case. And then you have the photon coming out. You can just continue doing this. And then what you're doing is basically a, a GSC state that comes out like this. Um, if you do Hadamard's on the spin in between, you're doing a 1D cluster. As you can see, you already have kind of the structure for making these trees here. So there's some very nice work by uh, Buturakis and, and uh, co-workers. So they looked at these old optical repeaters and the repeater states that you need there, but their scheme uh, generalizes to any kind of tree cluster, actually. So imagine that you have two spins. You have one that's a memory and uh, one that you're going to emit photons from. So you pump this, you make photons using the scheme before, and then you want to detest the spin. You can do it by a measurement. You could, in principle, also just kind of do a, a swap gate between the spin qubit state and the vacuum field. But anyway, you detach it. Then you have one branch of the tree. And then you just do it again. And in this way, you can build up your tree. Um, nice thing here is that the, if you have a tree structure with a branching vector up here, you have your t, b1, b2, and b3, um, and a depth of the tree, which is the length of the vector. Then the number of spin qubits that you need is basically the memory spins. You need d minus 1, and then you need like one emitter. You can also do, you can, um, so, and for the optimization that we're going to look at, the repeaters we're going to look at, we actually need like depth three trees. So we only need at this point two memory spins and an emitter at the repeater stations. Of course, the number of spin spin gauge scales with the number of branchings that you have in your tree and the depth. All right. So that's basically how we generate the trees. So far, I've hinted that we only need three, two memory spins and an emitter. We also need to do the re-encoding. The problem here is that we don't know in advance which first level qubits were lost and which were not. Right? So we're going to find out. But the problem when we find out, we don't want to try to encode into a new tree and then later find out, oh, well, the photon was actually lost, because then we're going to um, impose an error on our new tree. So we don't want to do that. We basically want to do like a, a loss tolerant way of doing it. And what we imagine is that we use these um, nice schemes for how to do a spin photon gate, uh, where you couple a spin to, uh, in this case, a single-sided cavity here depicted as a nano cavity. Um, and the photon comes in. And basically, what happens is that when the photon, if you make one of the photonic state couple to the spin, and the other one does not couple, um, and you have the spin level structure here, so you have like sp uh, spin qubit state one couples to the field with some coupling factor g. Uh, while zero does not. And um, you also have, of course, this excited level called decay with some decay rate gamma. And you have some uh, decay rate of the cavity kappa. And the whole kind of interface is characterized by one parameter, which is the cooperativity, um, which basically is, well, how, how good do you couple this coherently compared to your kind of um, uh, dissipation processes? Um, but by designing it such that only one of the qubits, photonic qubit state couples to the atom, you can actually make a controlled phase gate. And this is what you need. The idea is then that you send the cube, uh, photon in, you interact, and then you detect the photon afterwards, which we need to do anyway in order to 
um, teleport the incoming information into the new tree. And this detection, of course, also tells you whether the photon was there or not. Um, and if it was not there, then it's actually not a problem because we're going to let it interact with an auxiliary spin. So as you see here, there's a spin that couples the cavity, and there's the spin that's the root qubit. Great. Um, so because it only couples to the auxiliary spin, we can just reinitialize that and try again. And there's some formulas here for the fidelity and the success probability. I'm just saying from this, uh, once we're successful, we do a Bell measurement, near deterministic. We can do it by other means between these spins to encode it. And if we have competitivity for 100 or uh, an internal loss in the cavity around 1%, we get pretty good fidelity and success probability. So this can be highly efficient because, because we relied on detecting the photon. All right, and this basically the scheme down here is just showing that you continue the, the, the dashed box shows that you continue this operation where you try to encode the qubit. Once it's successful, then you map it into the other spin. All right, so uh, here you just need like one emitter and the memory spin. So, so far, we still only have two memory spins and one emitter, and that is actually what we need. So the performance, um, it's of course given by the local repetition rate times the transmission, encoded transmission probability. Um, and then if you have m repeater stations, this is basically just to the power of m plus 1. So we just not, we need this uh, eta e to be very small. This is what our error correction does. Um, we also have faulty operations, and we can kind of parentize that as we have some probability of having a depolarizing error on our encoding uh, operation, or we have some error on our encoding operation, and we can parentize that as just having some depolarizing error on any qubit in the state. And then that depends on that. Um, putting that in, we look at a cost parameter, which is basically the, the C here. Uh, sorry, it's, should, it's not the competitivity here, it's the cost parameter. And we optimize that. And here, in this cost parameter, we take into account that you know, it costs something to add repeater stations. And the, by increasing the tree size, this is also a problem, because that means basically that our rate is going to go down. We're going to have to emit more photons, do more gates. All that is to put in here. And, um, what we do is then do an optimization. We can put these re-encoding errors to be of certain uh, size. Note that it's per mil, this here. And if we have uh, photon emission times 1 nanosecond, gate times 10 nanoseconds, this is like a cost parameter. As you can see, it's not full torrent with respect to uh, uh, re-encoding errors, but it has some robustness, actually. If you increase the gate time, it changes slightly, which is basically because you change the repetition rate. Um, this is where you look at the rate, basically. Das lined. Uh, is for a two-way repeater with the same resources. You can see we can actually beat that quite uh, nicely. And well, the very steep dot dash line is just right direct transmission at a high repetition rate. So that we clearly win. If we increase the gate time, it changes a bit. But still, we are quite comfortable. Um, put some numbers in here. Uh, secret bit rate is around uh, 0 0.1 megahertz, or 1,000 kilometers. If we have this gate time of 10 nanoseconds, it's about 16 kilohertz if we have a more uh, modest gate time of 100 net seconds. So that's basically how we perform. Um, the, what we require is, of course, fast emission, photon emission, uh, an efficient spin photon interface, and spin spin gates. And all of these have been demonstrated to one degree or the other in both quantum dots and uh, diamond defects. And uh, so these are kind of the candidate systems that we uh, think of for this. Um, we have this time bin encoding of the photons because that's very nice for fiber propagation. And um, well, that, of course, also means that when we do these X measurements, it's not that trivial. We need to uh, have some delay lines, which you can see here that we need, actually need to put delays in to have a uh, deterministic X measurement in this encoding. But to summarize, um, what I've shown here is the one-way repeater that's based on photonic tree clusters. Um, we only need three spin qubits per repeater node uh, for uh, up to 1,000 kilometers here which is uh, substantially less than these over 200. And uh, we can get around 0.1 megahertz, key rates of 1,000 kilometers, um, and uh, possible limitation is with diamond defects and uh, quantum dots. I think the main challenges here is efficient in outcoupling. So I don't know if you noticed, but I've put this to be around 95% for the plots that I showed you. Um, and this goes also with the detection of these photons, basically. And then, as with all of these one-way repeaters, the gate errors that we need needs to be down on the 0.01% uh, basically for high. We can increase it a bit, and depending on how far you want to go, that changes it. But uh, that's kind of the order of magnitude. So this is what we need. 
nice thing here is that the number of gates that we need to do for the encoding is actually also just one two qubit gate. So that's also a thing here. And uh, this is joint work with uh, all these guys that's listed over here. So Hannes Pichler, Tom Schroeder, Anna Sørensen, Peter Lodell, and Michel Lukin. And uh, I'm from the QMath Center at the University of Copenhagen, supported by the Velux Foundation. All right, and uh, that's it. Our speakers are amazingly on time, so we have uh, time for questions. Questions for Anas? Yes. Uh, I had a question about the um, photon cluster machine gun. Um, if the three-level system has internal dynamics, because the emission process is, is random, uh, would that lead to like, phase pickups on the superposition that you're creating? And does that actually matter? Uh, do you mean, I mean, when, when you excite, when it actually emits the photon, whether that matters? Yeah, if the zero state is processing, or the, you know, the spin is processing while it's in that excited state, I would imagine there might be random phases picked up through the levels of that superposition. Sure, I mean, if you have a, if you have a, a, a phase, I mean, a precession of your, of your spin, of your zero and one that you don't know of, of course, that will in, make a, a phase error. Sure, yes. Okay, so the tree states aren't robust to that kind of error then? No, so that, okay, so yeah, no, the, the tree clusters are not fault tolerant, but they are robust. So uh, the way I would explain this is that any error on the first level qubits will map directly into an error on the logical qubits. However, any error on all the qubits below that, that actually does not, and they are protected basically because that's just redundant information that you encode through down the tree. So if you have any error of one of them, you, by measuring all of them basically, it's, it's an error correcting code. So, so you're robust in that sense but you're not full torrent because it's basically a one-to-one -one mapping of the error into the first level qubits. But it doesn't increase with the tree size. More questions? Maybe I can ask one. So I didn't quite catch. So uh, suppose you have really large sort of phase errors in your transmission line. Would these uh, codes sort of, would it work? Would it correct? Or it just corrects for basically loss? Uh, it, it, I mean, so again, um, it, it mostly is suited for loss. And you need the phase errors, um, in this case, to be at this Pamela level, basically. Unless you concatenate with some other code, which you need to only the first level qubits to be protected, basically. More questions for Johannes? OK, if not, let's uh, thank Johannes. All right, thanks. <laughs>